for joining us today for our weekly update on COVID-19 and the impact it is having around the world. We appreciate your attendance today and, and thank you all for joining. As we've been doing in the past, we know that this is a topic that is evolving quite rapidly and there are lots of changes which are coming up around the world and here in the U.S. Uh, pretty much on a daily basis. So uh, what we have uh, tried to do with these webinars is bring together the most relevant and, and accurate information we have around what is going on with COVID, what are the impacts that are taking place, and what are the things that uh, we really feel everyone needs to know. And, and bring all of that content to you. So we do try to do these webinar series on an ongoing basis. Lately, they have been uh, fairly focused on COVID-19 as that is the major thing that most organizations and companies are dealing with today. So this is a, a continuation of that. And we hope you guys have appreciated all the information as always. We are happy to take your questions. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat and, uh, and we will get to those uh, at the end as well as answer some of them as we're going. If for any reason we are unable to get to a question that you have, uh, please feel free to follow up with, with any of us. We are happy to, uh, to answer any questions that you may have. And just so everyone knows, th this webinar will be recorded and there will be copies of the presentation as well as the recording, uh, which everyone can access via a link that will go out after the webinar. Today, I am joined by Dr. Arwen Decker, who is our Chief Medical Officer here in North America, and we are going to provide you with a medical update as to what is the latest and greatest that we know of for COVID-19, as well as some of the impacts that we are seeing in terms of travel restrictions, how evacuations are working, some resources and things to consider for business preparedness, as well as go through some of the support services that, that we are finding to be very helpful for all of our, our global members and companies out there. Again, we will do uh, questions, so please, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A, and we will either get to them at the end, there should be some time for Q&A, or again, we will answer some of those as we are going along. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Arwen Decker to give a medical update. Dr. Arwen Decker, it's all yours. Thanks, Ben. Um, and we're going to start today by just going over the numbers and giving ourselves a, a, an understanding of what's going on with this virus around the world. Um, this week saw a significant increase uh, around the world. We're now up to 840, uh, 874,000 cases. I think everyone saw the news in the last week or so uh, when the U.S. Uh, was deemed to have the most diagnosed cases in the world. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, the deaths are around 43,000 deaths total, with 185,000 people who have completely recovered, which is really, uh, I think, the best news here. Uh, coronavirus now has spread to 180 countries. Basically, every country in the world at this point who has the capability to test is reporting activity of the virus, um, which is consistent with our understanding of this pandemic. Um, so. Going back to the basics just for a moment here, 80% uh, of cases remain asymptomatic or have very mild colds, uh, especially with the increased news coverage. Um, and I want to make sure everyone remembers that and keeps that as front of mind. This is a significant world health event, but on an individual level, the vast majority of people are having a cough, a cold, relatively minor symptoms, and I think we should keep that in perspective. Uh, the worldwide mortality is right now approximately 1% to 3%. That is still likely overestimated because we do not have full testing capability and are not necessarily diagnosing all of the cases. Uh, in the U.S. and around the world, what we're seeing is that those people over the age of 60 to 65 have the highest mortality um, and the highest risk, anywhere from 3 to 11% of the people who are infected in that age range are uh, dying from this. Um, they make up 45% of all hospitalizations in the United States and upwards of 80% of all deaths from COVID around the country. Uh, once you break 80 to 85, your mortality goes up significantly from this virus, and that pattern has held. Uh, one of the things that we noticed, uh, or that was reported earlier this week by the White House and the CDC, is that they're expecting with their projections to have somewhere between 100,000 to 240,000 deaths in the United States alone from this virus 
if the current mitigation strategies are upheld, that number uh, without those mitigation strategies was 10 times higher. Uh, the virus in, uh, on a very basic level is a coronavirus that uh, has sustained person-to-person -person transmission around the world and spreads by respiratory droplets, which are uh, expelled by someone when they cough or sneeze, creating a cloud around them, which is infectious to other people who come by. How sick people get from this, we've seen varies from, once again, usually very mild symptoms, fever, cough, some shortness of breath, all the way up to and including severe symptoms, which require mechanical ventilation. 80% um, of the population, once again, mild symptoms. Um, and the population over the age of 60, anyone with high blood pressure, heart disease, lung disease, or weak immune systems have significantly higher risk. In the United States and Europe, that constitutes over 20% of the population, over 60 million people in the United States, roughly about 55 to 65 million people in Europe. Um, I do wanna take a moment here to talk about one thing which we're noticing is becoming more prominent, both in the population that's getting sick, as well as the general population, which is the psychological effects. We are currently entering anywhere from the second to fourth week of social distancing and social isolation for a lot of people. Um, for people who have mental health disorders that we're seeing that is exacerbating their underlying mental health. Typically, we're talking about things like depression and anxiety. But as we're getting into this longer period of social isolation um, and social distancing, we are seeing some of those symptoms, particularly the anxiety and the depression showing up in people who did not previously had mental illness. Um, for a lot of us, uh, we are working with other people, we're managing others, and we may no longer be face to face with those people. I want to ask everyone to be cognizant that this is occurring and encourage your staff, yourselves, your family members to seek help um, if you're starting to feel those symptoms. Also, uh, ben will talk a little bit later. We have services that are offered through our company, which uh, can be utilized, and we want to encourage everyone to use those services early and often for the benefit of your, mem uh, your employees and yourselves. Uh, treatment, so the treatment for COVID-19 remains largely supportive, which is supporting hydration and breathing. We've seen a lot more uh, new stories of late coming out about the experimental treatments, uh, which are primarily reserved for people who are severely ill. Um, last week when we had this discussion, I pointed out that there were more than a few cases of people who had tried to use these treatments on their own without the direction of a physician and had some bad outcomes. Uh, I want to reiterate this again. The um, the uh, FDA has given conditional approval for the use of one medication, uh, basically off-label for uh, the treatment of uh, COVID-19, primarily hydroxy uh, uh, chloroquine. Um, this is being used in hospitals right now uh, as a form of treatment for COVID-19. How effective it is still remains to be seen. Um, the Another treatment which has started uh, to be tested more aggressively is a medication by Gilead called Resimavir. It was originally developed for the treatment of viral diseases, primarily Marburg fever, which is a, um, a illness similar to Ebola, the treatment of Ebola, and there is some hope it may be effective in the treatment of COVID, particularly in the severe cases. There are ongoing studies for both of those medications right now see if that uh, if they could potentially become treatments um, and then there's also ongoing uh, studies to see if azithromycin the antibiotic can be effective in reducing the severity of these symptoms um, i'm once again going to encourage everyone don't go out and try to obtain these from your doctor don't go and try to obtain these yourselves these are uh, promising treatments but they remain experimental and uh, the general public who uses them for mild symptoms is likely to suffer more side effects and harm than they are benefit. Uh, 
These treatments are primarily being tr attempted in people who are severely ill and who have no other recourse, uh, only because the risk benefit for that population is seemed to be beneficial, whereas for the average person, it is likely not. These medications are also still used for the treatment of other diseases. And if there's a run on them, we will likely cause harm to the people that need these on a day-to-day -day basis. So I encourage you, please be patient. Um, Mitigation strategies, which have been supported by the public health officials and the leaders uh, in fighting this disease, remain geared towards limiting its spread and preserving our healthcare resources. Uh, from the testing standpoint, there was a significant breakthrough in the testing. Uh, the FDA approved last Friday a test by Abbott Laboratories, which is able to provide a positive result in approximately five minutes and a negative result within. Uh, 13 minutes based off of an existing platform which Abbott had uh, in many hospitals. This test is uh, probably the first of its kind that I've heard of in the world in that it tests for the actual virus and it can be deployed pretty much anywhere that there is a stable power supply. Um, word from Abbott right now is that this test is being deployed initially to the areas that have been hardest hit by the outbreak in the United States, primarily um, the uh, Seattle area as well as the New York City area, with plans to continue deployment to other areas that have disease um, uh, growing. Um, and so we're hoping to see that testing pick up over the next two to three weeks, which should give more capacity uh, in the United States and other countries to test more aggressively. Uh, a lot of the hospitals have implemented in-house testing as well as uh, the commercial laboratories have begun testing. The turnaround times for the commercial laboratories remains a little bit longer, typically three to four days. Uh, hospital testing, uh, varies, but is often able to be performed in about 24 hours. We are seeing supply chain issues here where the reagents necessary to run the test may not be fully available. So although the test might be available, the result may not be able to come back as quickly as we would like. Outside of the United States, once again, testing varies greatly. Um, there are uh, some places that are doing wide base testing and others that are uh, doing limited testing strategies. The majority of these tests, um, there's about four or five different ways of testing for this virus and each country and each health um, jurisdiction is implementing multiple strategies to, understand, uh, to try to understand where the virus is in their population. In the United States, that testing has primarily been genetic testing, looking for actual signs of the virus. Uh, other countries, specifically in South Korea and China, they have access to more uh, varied forms of testing, which include testing for the body's reaction to it, so-called antibody testing. Um, and we're hoping to see an expansion of both types of testing around the world so we get a better handle on where the virus is. Uh, personal protective equipment and testing supplies remain uh, to some degree in shortage around the world. Um, as manufacturing is picking up in China, we are seeing that those shortages are being mitigated and stopped. Um, many hospitals are now reporting that they have enough equipment for at least the moderate range, if not the long range time frames. Um, and then uh, one of the big reasons that the US was able to uh, unfortunately take the lead in a number of cases in the world was an expansion of the testing capability, which has been ongoing over the last several weeks. A lot of us are seeing the bigger numbers and thinking that the um, outbreak is sort of raging out of control. That's not entirely true. When you look closer, you realize there are certain hotspots. But a lot of the cases that we're seeing are cases that are being detected through additional testing and not necessarily significant increase in the number and the mortality for the deaths beyond what we would expect for this increase in cases. Finally, uh, vaccine development, it is still expected to be about 12 to 18 months away. We've heard some reports from some manufacturers that they have more aggressive or ambitious timeframes to get a vaccine to market. Um, we remain hopeful that they're accurate, 
but I don't think we see enough evidence yet to say conclusively that this will be completely mitigated for that 12 to 18 month time frame. Um, just a couple of questions which have been coming up and I want to address right now while we have a second. Um, is there an antibody test so people can tell whether or not they've had it or are at risk? Uh, that's, an, that's a really good question. That test is not broadly available in the United States. Some areas of Europe do have a test where they can check for antibody response or uh, the immune response from someone who has been infected. And um, we're waiting for a broader deployment of that in the United States. Right now, the focus has really been on detecting the virus rather than detecting the immune response. Uh, other countries, South Korea, China, have that test available. We're not sure if that test means that you are now immune and free from getting re um, reinfection. It only tells us that you have been exposed and probably had an infection in the past. The exact understanding of what being infected once means to someone is still something that we're trying to understand. What we've seen is with influenza and a lot of other viruses, one exposure typically provides you coverage and immunity for a period of time, but that period of time varies, and we're not sure what that period of time is for COVID. Um, so for instance, for measles, the if you were exposed to measles either through a vaccine or through uh, catching the infection as a child, we're finding that typically have about 20 to 40 years of immunity versus say if you catch influenza, you have typically eight to 12 months of immunity. Um, the other thing which remains to be seen is how quickly this virus will mutate and change to undermine our immunity. Uh, influenza once again changes basically once a year. We don't know what that time frame is for this virus. Um, a couple other things that have been uh, reported in the media that potentially other vaccines have been helpful in protecting populations, namely the tuberculosis vaccine. That is an unsubstantiated claim, which we really can't support right now. Um, and then there's some question as to whether or not a person's blood type increases their susceptibility to uh, the virus. Once again, those reports and those questions were based off some very, very preliminary data, which was released about two days ago. Um, we don't know what those studies mean yet, and we don't know how applicable they are to the general population. So uh, I would not, uh, I would not view that as something that I would hang my hat on at all. Um, And we're gonna. So, uh, just a brief conversation about the uh, impact on health systems. Uh, the mitigation strategies we're seeing, social distancing, are really designed to uh, extend the resources we have in our health system. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's the 60 year old plus population which is at highest risk. And if they all become infected in a short period of time, they would very, very quickly overwhelm the health systems of pretty much any country in the world. And we have seen that happen in several places, including New York, Washington State, Italy, uh, parts of China. Um, countries are in various stages of their response. Uh, the epicenter of this epidemic really has shifted from Korea, uh, China, and um, uh, the Eastern Hemisphere over to the Western Hemisphere in Europe and North America. We're seeing that health systems can still become overwhelmed in less than a week. Uh, this only underlies the importance of mitigation strategies to prevent the spread of the virus and keeping those vulnerable populations from coming into contact with it. Uh, for our globally mobile populations, a uh, few things we want everyone to understand is healthcare systems around the world are limiting their services. So non-emergent and non-COVID related uh, illnesses may be deferred until there's a full handle on the, um, the impact and the scope of this outbreak, as well as once we're past the peak. 
the United States of peak is expected to occur in the next two to three weeks. There are some reports that Italy may be peaking right now and starting to come down. So we are hopeful that you, um, these health services will start re-engaging those elective and non-emergent services in the near future. There are several other place, countries which have not started to really see their full outbreak, and we're trying to keep an eye on them so that we can uh, give you up-to-date information. Each country has a defined process for how they're handling COVID care, and we're, uh, global mobile populations are not able to bypass those regulations. We've seen an increase in requests to try to move patients who may have COVID, uh, but we want everyone to understand that the ability to move someone with this disease is severely limited. We want everyone to prepare in advance for their environment, assuming that they may not be able to get access to uh, care the way they used to, both for COVID as well as for other uh, illnesses which are not COVID related, encouraging everyone to have their basic healthcare resources available to them at home, mainly first aid, um, any medications that you take chronically, and then basic treatment for simple endemic diseases, whether it's diarrhea, malaria, um, cough and cold, whatever those things are in your area, we are asking you to try to prepare in advance, at least for a couple of weeks, as your typical access to healthcare may be limited with the pandemic. Our best mitigation strategies are based around personal protection. Um, making sure you're frequently washing your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or using alcohol-based sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth whenever possible. Avoiding close contact with people who are sick. Frequently cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched surfaces, including phones, computers, uh, countertops, faucets, and the like. Uh, covering your nose and mouth with tissue when coughing or sneezing or coughing into your elbow throwing tissues that have been used directly into a closed trash can instead of into um, open trash cans. Most important, staying at home when you're sick, encouraging people who work with you to stay home when they're sick, or going on essential travel. Ben's gonna talk a little bit uh, about some of the new travel restrictions which we have seen now inside countries, inside the European Union, and um, following social distancing rules. Uh, flattening the curve once again is all about social distancing and spreading out the number of cases that will occur over a longer period of time to give the healthcare system a chance to um, have resources when everyone needs care. Protecting ourselves and others by preserving our healthcare resources for everyone, following the rules, which can include lockdowns, curfews, uh, shelter in place rules. And um, the one question we are getting more and more right now is when someone is infected with COVID, once they've tested positive, when can they return to work? Uh, that is something for which we don't really have clear guidance at this time. Um, what we are seeing is different approaches taken by different institutions. Um, the standard which has been used in a lot of locations has been uh, waiting for two negative tests after a positive just to ensure that the virus has fully cleared the body. That may not be available to everyone. Uh, other rules which have been used by the CDC and uh, the World Health Organization include a waiting period after the infection uh, to ensure that it has cleared without the need for additional testing. That can vary anywhere from one to three weeks. We're encouraging anyone who needs to return to work after uh, a presumed infection or a documented infection to contact their health provider for a clearance to return to work. And they will have the best information for what the standard is locally when you can return to your regular activities. So social distancing is the heart and soul of our mitigation strategy. So some things that we want to go over, do's and don'ts. 
avoid large gatherings. Uh, the standard definition is anyone thing over 10 people. Some countries are getting more stringent and lowering that number. You're going to say at least stay away from gatherings of 10 people or greater. If the rules within your local area are more stringent, we advise you to follow those. Maintain a perimeter of at least six feet around yourselves, um, avoiding contact with other people. In this scenario, we're talking about people you don't share your home or your physical space with during uh, on an ongoing basis. We understand that social distancing at home um, is basically not possible. Uh, avoiding visiting people over the age of 60 in person, uh, avoiding play dates with young children. Um, when we consider social distancing, we're really talking about social distancing of your household rather than you as an individual. So anyone your household comes in contact with, you can essentially assume that you are also in contact with, therefore limiting their exposure to other people is incredibly important as that is the uh, core principle behind social distancing. Avoiding frequent trips out for shopping, things that you should do. Um, and I think these are particularly important because as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing an increase in mental health con uh, concerns from the isolation that's coming from social distancing. So making it a point to socialize with your immediate family and the people you live with, using phone calls, video calls, especially if you are isolated or uh, if you have family members who are isolated to reach out to them and give them a sense of connection back to their community. Uh, walking dogs, outdoor exercise, visiting parks, listening music, TV, and reading, household repairs, cleaning, meditation, and yoga, which have both been shown to be very helpful in mitigating anxiety and depression, um, learning to cook or garden, basically activities that will help you stay active, keep your mind engaged, going for a drive, working from home, and then combined trips for essential um, for essentials that you may need, food, healthcare, banking, and fuel. Uh, if you are beginning to feel adverse effects from social distancing, please don't stop your social distancing, but uh, engage the other health care resources you have and contact your friends for uh, social support. Um, because the social distancing is important, but we want everyone to maintain their mental health. What should you do if you uh, or someone you know believes they've been exposed or has symptoms of COVID-19, first and foremost, don't panic. Uh, avoid public spaces, including public transportation, self-quarantine and stay at home. Avoid uh, people who are over the age of 60 or are at risk. If you have mild symptoms, use telemedicine. Uh, if that is available to you, contact your local health authorities for guidance. And if your symptoms are severe, particularly if you're becoming short of breath, or having difficulty doing your daily activities, such as going to the bathroom, cooking, providing for your basic needs, then you should definitely go to the emergency department. One question we've been asked frequently is, is heat an effective treatment to um, treat someone who is infected with COVID? Um, and I think this is really, the, the heart and soul of this question is based off of something that we're seeing happen in areas around the United States where they're using heat to sterilize equipment uh, that needs to be reused. So when it comes to disinfection, heat can be effective, but those temperatures are very high and um, they're being investigated, but they're believed to be helpful in sterilizing equipment material that need to be reused. Heat as a treatment for an overall viral infection or for COVID is not something we typically recommend. Um, the body's response to most infection is to raise the temperature, which is a fever. When that fever occurs, the virus tends to have a more difficult time reproducing and the body's immune response tends to improve at a slightly higher temperature, which is to say a temperature between uh, 100.4 Fahrenheit and about 104 Fahrenheit, so it's a very narrow range. We are not encouraging anyone to try to use heat as a means of self-treatment. Uh, your body does it under very regulated circumstances and um, only to the point that it is beneficial. Um, unfortunately, the, that fever can also be very uncomfortable, uncomfortable for people. So if your fever is problematic for you, it's impairing your ability to function or it is 
getting in the way um, of your uh, getting things done. I encourage you to take medications to break your fever, either ibuprofen, uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen, paracetamol, any of those are safe and appropriate in this scenario. At this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Ben to discuss some of the uh, travel advisories and guidance we are uh, suggesting for tr our travelers. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Arwin Decker. So aside from all the latest medical news related to COVID, as I'm sure everyone is aware, there are a lot of, of uh, impacts in terms of travel, business, and uh, the ability to, to move around the world right now. So we're gonna go over a couple of those. So first of all, the US State Department does have a general level four do not travel advisory for all global locations. So essentially the, the State Department is advising all US citizens not to travel anywhere globally. There are also bans in place right now for those outside the US entering the US, specifically uh, the European Union, China, and Iran. There are a lot of uh, other sort of restrictions for folks that come in. And if you are not specifically banned, most foreign nationals will, will have to, um, or, or, or likely to be subject to a 14 day quarantine period. 14 day quarantine period before being allowed to enter the US. Uh, I would also just sort of point out here that for any US citizens who uh, have essential travel, we are advising them to add a, additional days to whatever that trip is. So if you cannot avoid traveling internationally and you must go, uh, I would definitely be prepared to uh, either A, have a quarantine period upon entry into that foreign country and possibly a quarantine period upon returning to the United States. So just to be safe, if you are making a, an essential trip internationally, certainly if you're taking any maintenance medications, bring extra uh, to make sure that you have uh, time to cover those quarantine periods as well as clothes and, and, and all the things that you may need. So it's definitely a good idea to, to plan for a much longer trip than, than perhaps you normally would. In terms of the CDC here in the US, uh, they are advising essentially to do to, to cancel any non-essential travel to China, Iran, uh, most of Europe, and that includes the UK and Ireland. Also avoid non-essential travel to Malaysia and South Korea. They have also issued a domestic non-essential travel advisory recently that went into effect um, a couple days ago and essentially asking folks from uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut not to leave that area, as well as advising folks that they should not be traveling uh, to those locations, again, for any non-essential travel. So uh, New York obviously right now has the highest number of cases within the US, and, uh, and that is largely what is driving those domestic travel advisories. There are not any specific travel advisories uh, to other parts of the country. However, certainly uh, if you can avoid travel at this point, that is the, the best thing to do. Um, local authorities also have implemented their own me uh, measures. So Florida is testing all people traveling to Florida from the state. I know there are some other states that are, are doing similar things in terms of testing for people that are, that are entering the state. So as you are traveling around, you are likely to encounter some of those types of measures. Certainly we would encourage everyone to participate in those measures. So whether or not you are being stopped at an airport, uh, there are checkpoints around the world for, for, uh, for COVID. Typically that includes just a, uh, an infrared thermometer, but again, we would certainly advise if you do have to travel, please comply with all of those uh, those, those sorts of, of regulations. In terms of what's going on in, in other locations, so the European Union does have travel restrictions in place. All external borders um, are, are restricted, so uh, EU citizens are free to move within the 27 member nations. Uh, that includes the UK, but uh, for the next 30 days are, are essentially closed for all non-essential travel. Uh, people, again, can still travel within the European Union if you are already there. Um, so there are not restrictions there, uh, but again, certain countries and, and, and different locations within the European Union have their own uh, protocols. So it's definitely a good thing to check. Uh, question that we've been getting on this, so medical staff, medicine, and goods are not restricted at this point. So in terms of getting the crucial medicines and, uh, and medical staff where they need to be, that is, is not being restricted currently um, across the, the um, external borders. 
Multiple other countries have instituted their own travel restrictions as well. So um, again, it's, it's really good if you do have essential travel to any location to, to check out what restrictions may be in place, as well as there is uh, certainly a possibility at this point that, that your visa would be denied if they deem that your travel is, is not essential. So uh, definitely a good thing to, to, to check that. The other limiting factor that we are seeing is just around uh, flight suspensions and bans. So there are certain countries which have mandated airlines to, to suspend all flights in and out of their country, uh, as well as just because of the downturn in actual numbers of travelers, even for flights that are flying between locations which do not have restrictions, and that can include flights here uh, within the U.S. domestically, we've been seeing uh, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of flights being canceled because there's just not enough passengers to, to make that flight. So you can have a flight, have your ticket, get yourself to the airport and find out that the flight is being canceled because not enough people have showed up. So um, again, travel is very difficult at this point because of all of those different impacts. There is a, a very good website that you can check out. We do have a link in this presentation. It's, it's IATA, and they have cataloged all of the different travel restrictions around the world. So again, for any essential travel and, and trips that you cannot avoid, we would recommend taking a look at that website and, uh, and looking up your location. There are some great resources there for you to be able to uh, check out what the latest travel advisories are. Again, these are changing all the time, almost daily. So uh, even if you read something a couple of days ago, the day that you have to travel, we would recommend you check that out and make sure there's nothing that's going to be impacting um, either your, your domestic or, or international travel. So what do you need to do and consider if you do have essential travel? So again, uh, very good idea to, to make sure to check in frequently with the airline and make sure that that flight is still going to be taking place or, or that you are actually able to uh, to get into wherever you are looking to go. So uh, check those restrictions. They are changing quite a lot. As I mentioned before, many locations and airports have put in screening processes in place. So if you're arriving at an international airport, um, certainly participate in those screening processes. They are set up to uh, both help protect you as well as, as the public in those particular locations. Traveling with confirmed cases or direct exposure, uh, again, you can expect a quarantine. Um, that could be uh, just a standard practice in certain locations, so it's a good idea to check that. But as I mentioned before, be prepared to have your travel uh, your travel extended. So just to be safe, if you have a week-long trip, you should plan on potentially being uh, adding set essentially 14 days before and 14 days after that particular trip. So make sure to bring enough resources with you to, to, to last that additional quarantine period. Uh, if you do have uh, the ability to leave, I would also just sort of caution that the ability to re return home may also be impacted. So in certain cases, it is uh, acceptable to get into a country, and then once you've gotten there, we've seen countries change their restrictions and have actually had travelers stranded in locations and are still stranded there because the government has decided to, to essentially not allow anyone in or out. So uh, again, just, just make sure to be, uh, to, to be mindful of that and prepare that uh, you could have your, your, your travel uh, essentially extended by, by quite a long time, as well as quarantine. We've also gotten a lot of questions around how this is impacting some of the core services that are typically offered. One in particular are medical evacuations. So because of all of these travel bans and restrictions and uh, limiting of access to countries, there are some serious um, hurdles in terms of actually doing a medical evacuation uh, in this current environment. All of the capabilities still exist and are ready to go, including um, including biocontainment flights and those sorts of things. However, it is still very difficult to coordinate uh, these flights at this particular point. The other thing to consider is that many healthcare systems around the world are uh, becoming burdened by treating COVID-19 patients. So for even non-COVID related things, uh, the healthcare capacity in many countries has diminished and they are not accepting new patients because they are trying to keep as many beds as possible free. 
Um, so again, I, I'm not going to say that we, it is impossible to get an evacuation. Certainly in certain locations, there is no ability to move people in or out because of the specific government restrictions. Uh, but we do have to look at all of these on a case by case basis. And it is quite difficult right now um, to actually be moving people uh, around the world because of all of these different restrictions. In terms of medical evacuation, specifically for someone which has been uh, confirmed to have COVID-19, uh, these evacuations right now are essentially either very difficult or impossible, and that's mainly because uh, each different health jurisdiction and governments and health authorities are, are having and have put in place their own standards for how they are going to uh, attempt to limit the spread of COVID-19. Many of these would include actually, uh, again, quarantining folks or, or putting them in the hospital and not allowing them to leave until they are uh, symptom free and test negative for the virus. So even if someone would like to be uh, evacuated and or treated in another location, the local governments they are not uh, allowing that to, to take place. So um, as a rule of thumb, again, the capabilities do exist, uh, but many countries will not allow that person to leave. Uh, and then there are also issues with other countries accepting COVID patients. So in, in certain circumstances, uh, you might be able to get someone back to their home country, but even that is is uh, it can be very, very difficult given the the heightened and all of the protocols around trying to to slow the spread of covid nineteen globally. So a couple things on business preparedness that I wanted to call out here. So first of all, I'm sure a lot of people have either already implemented or have dusted off their emergency preparedness uh, response plans and are working through those now. A couple of things we just wanted to mention for everyone out there that, that we are seeing and, and certainly is, is very critical. First and foremost, uh, making sure that, that everyone has very defined roles and responsibilities and that they are called out within that document. Uh, as we've been working through this for several weeks now, we have seen certain uh, customers and instances where they had a, a phenomenal plan in place. All the roles and responsibilities were well documented, but the plan was created five or six years ago. And many of those people that were called out had actually moved left the company or were in new positions. So um, the, the folks that were actually tagged to, to, uh, to, to carry out the plan uh, didn't really understand and know that this was part of their responsibility. So really good idea just to take a look at these plans, make sure that all of the folks that have been identified are still in those current roles and are still the appropriate people uh, to be carrying that out. For this specific uh, type of, of an event, work from home and flexible scheduling is certainly something that we would uh, recommend. A lot of organizations here in the U.S. have moved uh, a significant portions of their workforce to work at home. If they are not able to do that, having flexible schedules for folks and understanding that, again, many people have their children home uh, from school. There are, are not uh, very available daycare centers or child care. Um, so having some flexibility and allowing uh, employees to, to deal with that as well as, as work on their own schedule is something that has proved to be very beneficial. And then certainly all of the travel restrictions and policies, again, outside of what governments are doing, a number of companies have instituted their own travel restrictions for their employees and their, their own um, safety measures. The other thing that we found that companies have struggled with a little bit uh, around this particular pandemic is really understanding and getting an accurate count of where all of their employees are around the world. And so as this has developed and spread to different locations, it has been a challenge for certain organizations to figure out exactly how many people they have in that particular country or, and or city and, and how to communicate with them. So communication is another key aspect of this and making sure that once you've been able to locate your employees and have an accurate account of, of where they are, they are able to establish that communication. So uh, with, with this particular event, it, it has not had a big impact on two-way communication, but in other events that we have seen, such as natural disasters and those sorts of things, um, communications can be uh, disrupted. And so one thing that can help with that is creating an in-case of emergency line, and it can really just go to an answering service, and that would allow employees to actually call in to, to the company, leave a message with their location, as well as the best ways to be able to get in contact with them, again, if, if some of those uh, some of those communication methods have uh, have have uh, have been uh, interrupted. In terms of keeping employees healthy uh, at work, so again, 
but work at home is really a great option if it is available. If it is not, uh, providing an appropriate workspace and, uh, and having the availability to, to maintain social distancing while at work is something that we would certainly recommend. And so in many offices, there are open concepts and people are fairly close together, if possible, uh, to, to be able to spread those workspaces out and, and again, maintain that social distancing is certainly something that, that has proved to be helpful, as well as avoiding unnecessary meetings and those sorts of things where everyone would, would, would uh, come into a small room, like a conference room and those sorts of things. Um, we've also seen certain companies which have uh, essentially the ability to have some of their employees work from home and other functions which must be in the office. So uh, it, it's definitely helpful if some employees are able to work from home. And then again, you can spread out the workspaces for those individuals so they can maintain that social distancing. And then certainly promoting healthy habits. So making sure that people are washing their hands um, and, and, and the, the office spaces themselves are, are being routinely cleaned and those sorts of things can be very helpful. And then also, I know Dr. Arwen Decker mentioned this a bit, but I do want to stress the psychological effects of this crisis. So um, aside from all of the fear related to COVID itself and, and possible infection, the impact that many of the social distancing measures have, have on, on folks, as well as the constant stream of information and, uh, and, and, and um, heightened media attention around COVID-19 has caused, again, psychological uh, effects. And we're seeing that both in terms of stress as well as uh, mental health issues related to isolation and not being able to go about your, your daily routines. And so it's something that we really want to be mindful of, as well as finally, just on the, the psychological uh, point is that we really do not want anyone who's showing any symptoms or sick at all to be coming to work. So creating an environment where uh, employees understand and know that they are absolutely and should take their sick time if they are feeling uh, unwell and stay at home rather than coming into the office is, is something important. There is still some stigma around uh, COVID-19, so people can be a little hesitant to come forward as they don't know what the reaction is going to be. So again, we just really encourage everyone to make it very clear with all employees that it, it, this is, um, it, is something that absolutely, if you have having any symptoms at all, whether or not very minor um, or, or anything else, please just stay at home. Don't risk it. You would not want the whole office to come down with this, and it is quite contagious. Any employees that are at high risk for exposure, so again, employees over 60 or those that have uh, underlying health conditions, they should be looked at and identified as, and certainly um, potentially moved out of that office environment so they are able to maintain their social distancing. And then the final thing I'll just mention here is to, to make sure to to obtain your information from reliable sources. Um, there's a lot of information out there right now. Not all of it is good information. So getting your information from reliable sources is, is, is really critical right now. So what are those reliable sources? Uh, where we have gotten all of our information from really centers around the, the World Health Organization, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, so the CDC. Uh, also, there is information coming out of the European CDC, the Chinese CDC. In terms of keeping up to date with the spread and the, the current numbers, Johns Hopkins Center for Sy Systems Science and Engineering, that is where we got our most up-to-date uh, numbers that were shared a little bit earlier in this presentation. They are keeping that updated frequently, and you can uh, go ahead and check it out. It's open for everyone uh, to take a look. And then finally, I mentioned IATA which is the travel center. So they have cataloged all of the different travel restrictions. So excellent place for, uh, for taking a look if you do have to make a trip. Okay, um, so again, some of the resources and, and uh, I know we've mentioned it a couple of times, but I do think it's important because uh, there has again been a lot of information coming out specifically around COVID and less information coming out around what are some of the responses to all of the impacts that this has had on, on people individually, family, society, and those sorts of things. So um, when we get and have our daily routines uh, kind of uh, completely changed and, uh, and everything is different, that can certainly cause, um, cause some, some stress in people as well as uh, exhibit mental health issues. So intense feelings, feeling shocked and overwhelmed, hard to focus, concentrate, make decisions, 
People can also have physical, um, physical symptoms, so headaches, dizziness, and nausea, changing in sleeping or eating patterns. So again, really, really important to make sure that uh, employees and everyone understands that if they are starting to feel these sorts of things, to ask for help, uh, talk about what's going on and their feelings, uh, identify the, the type of supportive services that, that people have access to. Employee assistance program is something that uh, we are, are highly recommending for folks that are having a hard time with all of the impact that this has had and social distancing and those sorts of things. It can also be a good resource for uh, for any leaders within your organization which are getting flooded with questions and are a bit overwhelmed with everything that's going on. So again, would really like to call out the, the mental health aspect here and, and the resources that are available uh, for, for everyone. Also wanted to mention, uh, so again, we, we just talked about the employee assistance program. So uh, through United Healthcare Global, we have um, the Optimize Wellbeing program, it is available 24-7. Anyone is able to use that, so it's available for uh, all of the employees, our members, their dependents. So uh, it's all telephonic, which fits uh, very well with uh, social distancing and can be an excellent resource for people that, that need someone to talk to. We have seen utilization of the employee assistance program over the last several weeks go to, to very, very high levels much above what it typically is, which is great. That's what it's there for. So again, just a, a reminder that this can be an excellent opportunity to, uh, to, to promote these resources for anyone who, who would uh, have a need to use it. And, uh, and it is available 24 seven, so they can always reach a live person to, to speak to as part of the uh, My Wellbeing program. Finally, just a couple of other uh, support and uh, services that are available. Certainly, myuhc.com and the Health for Me app. There are lots of um, lots of resources available on our website, as well as travel advisories as part of our intelligence center. So, medical intelligence, security, all those sorts of things are. Uh, are available on our website for people to check out. So again, a lot of the alerts have been going out and are specific to the implications of COVID-19, but there are still other things going around and uh, around the world. So country information and security um, and intelligence, we are sending out many, many alerts daily. So if anyone has interest in getting those alerts, you can head over to our website and enroll for those alerts. I mentioned the employee assistance program. And the final thing I'm gonna mention is, is virtual visits and or telemedicine. This is again another excellent opportunity for folks to be able to utilize the healthcare system and not have to uh, break sort of their social distancing. We have seen a big increase in telemedicine and virtual visits as well. Um, so that is available for folks. And uh, during these times, a lot of providers have switched some of their appointments to telephonic and that's, that's totally fine and appropriate. So it is an excellent option. The final thing I'll just sort of mention, if you are able to use virtual visits, it is a very, very good way to get that treatment. If you are unable to do so and do need to go, certainly in any kind of a medical emergency, get yourself to the emergency room. But if it's not, we would really recommend calling your provider. Many uh, physicians' offices and provider groups have put in place uh, some specific measures in order to uh, to, to limit the spread of COVID-19. So uh, certainly don't just show up at your doctor's office and or the emergency room if you don't have to. We would really advise you to call before you do. And again, if you can, use telemedicine or virtual visits. We've got about six minutes left. So with that, I want to uh, see if there are uh, additional questions that we may have. So I'm gonna scroll through the Q&A here and we can start an, uh, asking some of, uh, answering some of those questions. So first one um, I see here, any suggested reliable uh, sources. So again, the CDC and the World Health Organization are, are excellent places to go. Certainly for US advice on travel, you can go to the State Department and for travel, IATA, um, the website. Again, you guys will be able to have access to a copy of this presentation and the links are on there. Um, so that is something that, that you will all have access to. But again, we would really recommend if you're, if you're looking for specific information related to, to COVID-19 um, that you, you do so through either the World Health Organization or the CDC. Um, there is a lot of either misleading and or just uh, plain false information that is spreading around the internet and in certain uh, media reports. So um, that's definitely uh, the places that, that we get our information for and, and from, and that informs all of the decisions that we're making. 